Um, I'd love if we could just, if you guys could introduce yourselves, um, tell us your name, what company you're from, um, and what you're working on right now. And also, I had a couple people come up to me and say what the name of my, or ask me what the name of my company was. So it's School of Bots, because some people were looking up School Bots, and we're like, we can't find you. So I just wanted to clear that up um, for those of you guys that I wasn't able to talk to. Great uh, School of Rock pun there. <laughs> Um, so my name is Chloe Condon. I am a developer evangelist at Sentry.io. We're an open source error logging and reporting tool. My name is Kirill Kireyev. I'm the CTO of a San Francisco based startup called Giant. And Giant is basically an AI doctor. So we work on Alexa, Facebook, or we have our own app. I think this will work, yeah. I'm Rabi. Uh, I'm co-founder and CEO of a company called EvaBot. Uh, we basically uh, automate physical gifting by using a chatbot which chats with a person to figure out their taste and preferences. And then we ship them a surprise gift. Hi, I'm Andy Morrow, the co-founder and CEO at a company called Automat. Um, I think the reason that I'm on this panel is we've built a totally horizontal conversational AI platform, but we've only leveraged it against a single vertical, which is beauty. So I sell beauty, makeup, skincare, that kind of stuff. Love it. That's awesome. So we have a good variety of different types of verticals. So my first question for you guys is, I know you two at the end already answered that, um, and you guys can share a little bit more about this as well. What verticals are you guys working in right now, and what are the problems that you're solving with chatbots there? Whoever wants to go can start, since we've got three mics. <laughs> start. So, as I mentioned, we're in the healthcare space, and particularly primary care, patient-facing primary care. And the problems that we're trying to solve, you, that I think chatbots are a great solution for, is, um, well, A, collecting accurate information, but B, developing empathy, developing uh, kind of trust with our patients both for the reason of actually just helping them feel supported when they're distressed because they're sick, and also to open the door to be able to collect much more rich data about their lifestyle and health habits, which is all really important things. And we can kind of get these long, longitudinal snapshots into their life uh, in a way that most doctors don't even get to do. So I think that kind of conversational interface is a, is a key to creating that kind of trust. So in beauty, but beauty is almost like every other CPG platform, I think, or CPG customer, um, there's a few things that we solve for. One is sales. That's all customers care about at the end of the day. If you can't drive sales, then they don't really care. So everyone up here will talk about we drive a brand engagement, we drive lots of engagement, we collect data, we do all that stuff. But if you can't drive sales, it doesn't matter. So we drive sales. We also do really good brand engagement. So I'll give you guys hard numbers. These are all public case studies. So. We've driven in 35% higher average revenue per user with customers, so accounting for people that chat with the bot versus don't. Uh, beauty and skincare are interesting categories. They require expertise, advice, guidance, recommendation, sort of a consultative sales process. That's why Sephora exists, uh, Alta exists, ex uh, et cetera. And there's certain people, we, we did a study, 1,500 women um, between the ages of 18 and 65, and two thirds of them said they didn't want to talk to a person in a store. They need help, the same two thirds said, you know, uh, I'm confused and overwhelmed by the number of products in a store, but two thirds of them also said, I don't want to talk to anyone. And about 71% of them were actually on their phone at Google, Sephora, and Amazon, which is great if you're those companies, but sucks if you're a brand who are not one of those companies. So generally we're providing those things, uh, expertise, advice, guidance, et cetera, both online and offline for our customers driving sales we too are collecting lots of data, um, which is all first party data. They don't have to license it from Google or Facebook. Um, and we are, we've noticed that like, I mean, we're a conversational AI platform. We've got 40% of my team have PhDs. I've been in this space almost 20 years. Um, we didn't start it three years ago, like jumping on the bot bandwagon. And so it's a conversational AI platform for them. So the last thing we're solving for them problem wise is we're collecting data in chat that then is useful in voice, but like I said, all those things pale in comparison next to we drive sales. Yeah, uh, so, so yeah, we, uh, our vertical is gifting. Uh, I'll tell you like how we actually got into whole, this whole thing. So 
the insight which we got was um, humans are more comfortable sharing their desires with machines versus other human beings. And how that insight came into was, you know, uh, I actually moved to US from India in like 2016. So early 2016, I was like trying to figure out what to do next. Um, and I was going to conferences and events like these uh, and was trying to build relationship with people. Now, the problem with, you know, these kind of events is, you know, once you go out of the event, no one remembers you. So I thought maybe I'll send them a gift. But coming from a different country, I didn't have a cultural context. I didn't know what to gift. I didn't know where this person lives, all this information. So I came up with the idea that, you know, I got a new mobile number. And then I used to, I used to take the card of the person and then used to text them saying, uh, hey, I'm Ravi's assistant. And he wishes to send you a thank you gift for whatever advice you gave him yesterday. Uh, would you like to chat? And then to my surprise, everyone was like, yeah, why not? Uh, and then we, like, I used to ask them questions like, hey, do you like coffee, beer, or wine? And then coffee, oh, you like Phil's coffee, blue bottle, or what? And then people were giving me all the information. I was, like, surprised. And then I basically went back to them and asked them, like, hey, why are you giving all this information? And they were like, um, of course, you will not have an assistant. You, you don't look like a person who will have an assistant. So that was definitely a bot. So that insight was, was pretty surprising. And then most of these people like, then came back to us saying, hey, we would like to use this for our clients. And I was like, we don't have a company. So, so with, then we thought, OK, maybe like, this space can be very exciting, uh, especially because um, you know, the way it works is uh, humans in this context, you know, gifting context, when you're sending a gift to your client, is, is, is a very awkward conversation. And you want to send the right gift. You don't want to kind of mess up. Uh, so a chatbot is a perfect solution because then you, s you send an email to someone, you CC EY in that email, and you say, hey, thank you for this, thank you for that, or happy birthday, I'm CCing my gifting assistant, and she will take over. And then EY chats with the other person, uh, figures out what they like, where they live, all this information, and then a surprise box lands. You know, no one decides what the actual gift is, it's decided by a machine. And that insight then led to you know, a company uh, we now have more than uh, 800 business customers, and have, we have sent more than 20,000 gifts. The interesting thing is, you know, more than 20,000 people have actually chatted with Eva to give their information to get a gift like that. And so, I believe, you know, when chatbots are done in a very particular, like, uh, specific vertical and solve a very specific problem, uh, it, it, it works, and it works like magic. So, yeah. Yeah, um, how many developers are in the audience? I'm just curious. Okay, cool. So to give you a little bit of context on, on what Sentry is, um, we're an error logging and re reporting tool, which sounds really great when you give your marketing pitch. But basically what that means is anytime you run into an error, um, we alert you of that error, the developers of the error in real time. So for example, this, these can be really critical situations. It can be the difference between you being in the tenderloin and not being able to call a Lyft and then deciding to call an Uber because you need to get out of the tenderloin. So people make decisions um, based on using a product, uh, based on how, how well it works, and especially if they run into an error, you know, that's something you want to resolve. Um, basically what our product is able to do is we're able to not only alert developers of when this happens, but we're also able to collect the data of those users as well, so that way you can reach out and say, hey, you know, this issue you were running into before, um, it's been resolved now if you choose to do that. So um, our bot is a lot less conversational and more practical. Um, our bot uh, is a Slack integration where basically, uh, let's say you set it up so you want to know when 500 users have experienced an error in Australia. You can get that specific with it. Um, so um, if you're alerted in Slack, instead of just having a bunch of noise, it'll alert you and say, um, hey, here's an issue. We have um, drop down options and buttons where you can say this is a known issue. You can resolve it if you want to. Um, you can choose to go into the UI if you want because as developers, the worst thing we can be doing is context switching all the time and opening multiple tabs and trying to debug. So basically what this bot is doing is putting all of the data for that error in one spot so you can resolve it, assign it to someone else, um, do several different drop down options um, and buttons that we have within Slack, um, in Slack so that way you're not you know, hopping into different UIs, looking at Datadog and looking at everything in different, you know, we, we don't want to have to stop everything that we're doing uh, just to resolve a bug. So basically taking resolution time down from you know, two hours to like five minutes. So what are some of the biggest challenges then that you guys see when implementing all these solutions in your respective verticals? 
Well, in our experience, there, there's a few. Um, so we are trying, again, we're trying to do medical triage. We're trying to ask you questions about your symptoms and give you a diagnosis, and, um, which is in its own set of challenges, just designing that and requires a lot of mer- medical expertise. But the, the sort of the more, another layer of, of things that are challenging is actually what happens when things, when the user doesn't actually just want to do the thing that you think they want to be interested in doing. So if they have particular health questions that are not related to just checking their symptoms or kind of getting a diagnosis if, or if they have if they're checking it for their child for instance or if they have other kind of situations and so be able to anticipate and gracefully handle all these intents and um, desires that are not sort of part of our st- standard flow is, is very much one um, one situation uh, we also work with you know in a number of countries including Latin America so we, we have to support a multitude of different languages, right? And each of those languages has their own different slang and different ways to, even, even in English you can imagine, you could say, I have a headache, my head hurts, my head is killing me, I have a pounding headache, all these kind of things. And I imagine you multiply that by number of different regional dialects and languages that it becomes a very um, challenging problem in that way. Um, and then lastly, kind of the thing we think about a lot is kind of com- balancing the, 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 the collecting the necessary medical information, which is obviously important for practical reasons of diagnosis, with making it actually be somehow interesting and fun and engaging and not just kind of like, do you have this, do you have this, you know? So um, combining empathy and personality with what is typically a very dry area. How about, um, how many of you guys in here are building chatbot platforms of some kind, like NLU or Dialog or whatever? (laughs) So um, the dirty secret that you guys all know is that you're all consulting companies, you're all professional services teams, and that's, I think, the hardest thing in the whole space right now. So you guys are building consumer solutions, I think that's a bit different, but anybody that's out there that's saying they're building a SaaS platform is lying. They're basically doing consulting, and uh, the reason for that is that this, I mean, I started out at Nuance, some of you guys will know that company. There's never been a go-to-market in the conversational AI space, speech recognition space, whatever, that hasn't been services-led. And so that's why IBM and Nuance and other companies like that are ruling that space because they have 1,000-person services teams or 10,000-person services teams, and they have multiple hundreds, low thousands in terms of R&D. And so I think that's like the, that is like the fundamental existential question of this whole room, I think, right now is can, at least in the B2B side of the world, can we turn this into something that customers can build themselves or where the solutions are off the shelf? And so fundamentally, that's why we went vertical, right? So we, um, one of our first big customers is L'Oreal. L'Oreal is the biggest beauty company in the world, the third largest CPG company in the world. They do like 27 billion in revenue a year. Um, When we started with them, we were doing seven-figure contracts and those were largely consulting. There was a services component to it. Um, and that was nice. It was great to get those checks, but you can't build, build a venture back business on that, right? And so the hardest thing for us was getting to the point where we could um, actually prepackage stuff. So we launched, I was in New York this week at WWD. The geek in me thought one day he, maybe he'd be at WWDC. Instead, he's at WWD. For those of you that don't know, that's Women's Wear Daily. Um, that's a major publication in the fashion, beauty, luxury space. And so we launched a range of what we call virtual beauty advisors, uh, starting with a virtual skincare advisor. And this takes our deployment time down from, we've had meetings where it's two, three meetings and we're getting signed contracts. Um, and we're able to go live in a matter of weeks, like we're talking three, four weeks instead of three, four months. Um, and I think that's ultimately you know, what many of us need to be doing in this space is going super vertical, solving real problems, getting real ROI, getting real case studies, and that's been the hardest thing for us because we have this lovely chatbot platform like all of you that has AI that we built ourselves, that has visual tools, that has analytics. Guess what? You're all dead if that's all you have. Like, that is not enough. That's table stakes for everybody. And so I think you need to be able to get to the point where you can walk in and say, I can get you this much sales, right? I can get you um, this much cost savings if you're doing customer support um, in a vertical because anything other than that is just the horizontal stuff is not going to fly. Yeah, I think on our end, um, obviously we have a very different use case. Um, 
It's mainly just awareness of the bot. I think a lot of times when you have a specific integration, getting people to adopt that, that can be challenging. Part of that is, is marketing, but also engineers can be really stubborn and want to build their own solutions. Um, so um, a lot of my job is evangelizing these features, but I think another piece of it is, I mean, I think we've all been guilty of using a piece of software and just using the the basic like out of the box version of it and uh, I mean I love when I go to a conference or someone says oh you know I love Sentry I wish it had you know XYZ feature and I go that does exist <laughs> um, so I think just making sure people know like hey we do have this slack integration this is it, it's not some frustrating thing that takes like 10 minutes to set up it literally takes two seconds you just Slit, uh, put a button on, um, but I think also um, showing people how useful it is. Um, I think once people use the Slack bot, they go, oh wow, I don't have to take all these extra steps to go into the UI and solve a problem. So just general awareness, I think, is, is a challenge that we face a lot. Yeah, so uh, again, in our case, um, uh, the challenge, challenges are different. Our challenge is not like bot discovery because we work with a lot of these businesses who are sending a lot of gifts. Uh, so we automate the gifting for them. So they are kind of you know, sending the gift to the recipient and CCing Eva. So the recipient discovers the, the, the chat bot through, through the email or text or whatever. Uh, for us, the challenge is you know, when, they, when they get the link and they click the link and they start chatting with Eva, uh, how soon are they able to finish the conversation and how much information we are able to gather in that, uh, say, one minute conversation. Because say, uh, the problem we are trying to solve is uh, a gift card versus a real gift, but it still like, you know, uh, you know, uh, basically matches your taste. So we are trying to collect information like, you know, it's a fun game, like you like this versus that, you, know, you prefer this versus that, uh, and then we ask for the address and all those things. So for us, the challenge is not the NLP, but mostly about how do we um, uh, kind of you know, arrange arrange the whole chat flow in a way that you know people are more engaged while they are chatting with Eva. Uh, so yeah. Awesome. Now for the businesses that you guys are working with, are they starting to depend on the chatbot for a certain percentage of business? Or for example, you know, with beauty, are they starting to depend on the bot for a certain percentage of sales? Like how, um, I guess, influential is the chatbot right now in their businesses? So there was like a stat earlier that was somebody said, uh, here before that there was 40 per, there was like a 40 percent increase in bookings like that that stat was wrong i want to correct that because like this the stat is 11.8 right stefan from assist is the guy that worked on that that was from an assist stat like the industry is not supported when we all go around like giving bullshit stats so i'll answer that question super honestly right so i can go in and i can go i can get you 35 percent uh you know higher average revenue per user my absolute sales numbers are like nowhere near where they need to be to drive a solution that this company is gonna keep on for the next five years. Now, what I can tell you is we're expanding, right? So being vertical has helped us because, you know, it's not all tech, right? I mean, a lot of it is you build relationships, you build trust, um, the companies see you bending over backwards to make the tech work for them, all that kind of stuff. And so like we've expanded from initially one brand to I think we're now at 13 brands at L'Oreal. We've gone for at Cody, who's about the fifth biggest beauty brand. We started with one brand, we're now at two. Um, you know, we've gone from one geography to now being in 17 geographies. So like there's real expansion happening. But I will say like it depends who you talk to, right? So the CMO, um, cares about service, right? She says, I love chatbots because I care, not, I don't mean customer service, but she means like, well, there's a lot of talk in CPG right now about service beyond product, right? So if you walk into a store shelf and there's 100 products on the aisle, everyone's looking to differentiate. And I think a conversational AI experience differentiates them as a brand and as a product, and so they care about that. They do care about the first party data. They do care about doing test and learn in an AI space, but ultimately the CEO, every time I talk to the CEO, goes, where's my sales? And I can give him that, the relative numbers, and then he goes, what's the absolute number? And I cringe and I give it to him, right? And so I'm not gonna give you that actual number, but I will say I don't think many people are driving absolute numbers, and part of that is just like, we have to come to grips with this as an industry. Not enough people are chatting up to bots, right? Like it's just, it's a thing, and it's becoming a line item, and I think we've made a ton of progress in the last three years, but, you know, getting people into these things, that's why I asked Rob from Google, like, I really think as an industry, 
Like I would love to see us workshop one day, get a bunch of smart people. We're all going to be out of business in a few years if we can't um, solve this problem of actually getting people into the things. And nobody wants to talk about that, but like that, that is the hardest thing for anyone is driving an absolute dollar value result as opposed to a relative result. Everyone's driving great relative results right now. So one case that probably could speak about is, um, so we have a few partnerships with pharmaceutical companies, which is not a core business because it doesn't focus on diagnosis per se, but for instance with Merck, we've been running this uh, pre-diabetes awareness campaign in Latin America, South American country, right? countries, right? So, um, which is basically, it's completely not branded with Merck, it's just, it's our chatbot, and we have also been employing these clever social media marketing and influencer, social media influencer marketing campaigns to get a lot of, you know, users often between the ages of 15 and 25 in these countries um, to go through our chat dialogue about kind of risk factors for diabetes, health habits, and stuff like that. And we don't recommend any drugs or anything. We just say, okay, if your score is high enough or we suspect your score is high enough, go to, uh, you, you probably should go, recommend they go to a pharmacy and get tested for diabetes, right? So very simple. But, and we've had over 2 million users use a chatbot, and majority came from the, these campaigns, right, that we kind of run and, and, and create. And I think I would venture to say you would never have those kind of numbers if you were just sending them to some kind of forum or something like that. Like nobody wants to, especially if you're, you know, 16 years old, just not interested in you at all. But a chatbot is, especially a chatbot with personality and chatbot with humor is actually quite interesting. And we see a lot of this kind of grassroots, uh, you know, excitement about it. People play with it, people send it different pictures, ask it questions, I mean, all sorts of things. So there's this really interesting phenomenon, especially for the younger demographic where they actually quite, surprisingly entertained by these, by these chatbots, much more than we, we hope for, but it actually is great for projects like this where you want to actually kind of reach out to a large demographic and uh, get a lot of users. Um, so that, that's worked really well for us. Um, I probably can't speak to the same degree to the older demographics. You know, obviously uh, it's a different equation, but certainly for the, the younger population, it's a really, it can be a very powerful engagement tool. So um, developers are pretty picky on what products they decide to use to get notified of things of. Um, we obviously have a bunch of different integrations with things like PagerDuty. Um, people really, especially at, it varies from company to company how people like to get alerted. Um, if anybody's been on call before in this room before, we all, we all know how lovely that is to go to dinner with our friends and have to bring our laptop along. Um, so for the Slack one specifically, um, People who use that integration rely on it very, very heavily. That is how they are getting their notifications to know when, they know that if they get a notification on Slack and if they get several notifications on Slack, um, that something is going wrong. Um, of course, the way that we have it set up, we don't want it to just be constant noise, especially if you're working on a larger application like Airbnb. Um, if you're getting an alert for every single error that happens to you, you're just gonna have a never ending stream of notifications. Um, so um, being able to make those alerts relevant and specific, like we only wanna be notified of these type of issues um, is really important. So we find that the people who use our Slack chatbot um, it's basically, it's their like red flag. They know that's when they need to drop everything and, and look into an issue. So I think we are running out of time. Um, do we want to do any questions or? Yes, but not know? until these guys clap for you. Okay. These guys are going, give a round of applause. Great <laughs> right, information. Give them a round of applause. Can we turn this down a little? <laughs> All right, who's bought a question? There you go, sir. Thanks everybody. Uh, question is specific to something you asked, but for all of you, and, and I'll paraphrase, you'd mentioned we're not chatting enough. So I guess two-part question is, is that because of the technology? Is that because of awareness? Um, what do you think is the reason for that? Question one, and then based on your answer, what would be the number one thing to improve that adoption? I stole his mic, so you have to give him one. <laughs> so I actually think there's a ton of hope in, in this is me in a good mood, by the way. Um, so it's th this, uh, I had a great run across the bridge this morning. Uh, so I think there's actual hope. So in this study that we did, right, against 1,500 women, we got a third party to do it, Lakefield Research, like one of the questions we asked them after these questions about I'm confused and overwhelmed by the number of products and I don't want to talk to someone and I'm already on my phone, 
is we asked a whole bunch of questions about virtual beauty advisors, which is a name we made up, right? But people get it now, like pre-Siri, pre-Alexa, pre-other things. I don't know that that name would have resonated, but there was actually like about a 48% awareness of what that was, or at least people thought they knew what it was. So I think there's like a lot of hope, which is people know what conversational interfaces are now, right? Like I built one of the first mobile voice assistants, like Domino's Pizza, if you've ever ordered that. I worked at the company that built that. Nobody even knew what the hell it was. Like the only people that got it were stoners, right? We literally did usability and they'd be like, this is gonna be awesome when I'm big, dude. Like it was, those are the only people that got it. And so now everybody gets it. And so we asked these women, if a virtual beauty advisor was available, you know, would you use it? And 49% of women said they would definitely or likely try it. And so, and I think like the way we characterize that is we call that sort of a tipping point. That's not like an 80, it's not a great marketing number for me, but it's an okay number. It's a number that says there's enough people out there who are willing to try this thing. And so I think it's ours to lose, to be honest. I think people, there is awareness and there are people who are saying there's something between, the web has been built on a backbone of self-service for 25 years. Like that is not awesome, right? And so I think we have this huge opportunity to build a world where expertise and advice and guidance and all these words that I always use are there and I think there's an appetite for it. I think the reality is all of this tech that everyone's talking about, the chatbots suck. They all suck. Except they're for Gingibot. They're all linear. They're all like the NLP is actually bullshit, right? Most people aren't good at it. Nobody's truly, we're going to talk at an AI conference on Friday. There's a paper by this guy named Young in 2000. Every single platform being built in this room is effectively built on that architecture, and nobody has innovated anything. And so the tech isn't that amazing, despite what we talk about, and so the experiences aren't that amazing. And so I think the ultimate answer is just get off your ass, work harder, and actually innovate something, because NLP and dialogue, not enough, because your, your bots suck. And so that's what we're challenging ourselves to do, is get to the point, and I will say this, I'll end on this, it's a bit pitchy, but like, we, get, we have never gotten anything lower than 82% customer satisfaction rating, and we've gotten up to a 92% NPS rating and CSAT rating. Our stuff, you'll try it, go check it out. Like it's, a lot of them are linear or whatever, but we've picked the right use cases and applied the tech in a way that is useful and gotten to good results. And so I think it's a little bit of art and science, but we just have to work harder. I think we just have to make these things, we have to call it out when they suck, call it out to ourselves when they suck and build something better because most of them are not that interesting. And right now, like I was excited to see this room, it's filled, but like the chatbot hype is over, man. We're heading towards the trough. I think or this, this winter is gonna be like the pit right? And then we're all going to have to dig ourselves out of it with products that actually work. The winter is coming. Round of applause for that. Motivate yourself for that. <laughs> Would anyone care to follow up with another question? Okay. Yes. My new friend in the back here. All right. Pass this down. Hi. Um, regarding shopping with chatbots, I think one of the biggest conversations we're having, especially in voice tech, is that we get a low retention off of the Alexa skills. Sorry if it's ringing. Um, with Alexa skills. But do you see shopping more of an acquisition tactic so you're getting new customers with L'Oreal and or other beauty companies? Or is it a retention tactic or both? Um, retention is tricky, right? What I will say is, I'm going to hand it over to Robbie so somebody else can talk. Um, push messages are a great way to get retention, and I think on voice, what our customers want is a conversational AI experience. They don't want someone to do voice and someone to do chat. They're looking for someone to do everything, and so voice is very hypey. Voice will be where bots are right now in a year and a half, which is it'll be a smart speaker category, and no one will give a shit about it, and all this business you're getting right now will dry up, and you'll actually have had to build something cool. So um, I would consider figuring out a push mechanism that draws people back in. Robbie's been doing this a lot. So, so uh, I think um, you know, you know, for us, the most important thing, you know, whenever you are building anything, is uh, what problem are you solving, and uh, is chatbot the critical component which will solve that problem or not? If chatbot is not the critical component which is solving the problem you are promising to solve, then I don't think you will get that um, uh, retention or, or engagement with your chatbot as you're expecting. Maybe one broader point to say, which applies to the previous question too, which I think one ingredient that just have not been, I don't see explored in the chatbots enough is novelty, right? The experience of like, you don't know what's going to happen the next day when you talk to it, right? It's very cut and dry. And so that's like, that's the art part of the art and science they mentioned. I think really 
if you fl if you flash if you invest time into it, it'll be really powerful. You know, because if you if you're essentially just doing the equivalent of a few checkboxes and a button a form in a chatbot, it just that's there's not a lot of value for that. But if you're creating an interesting story arc or development or personalization, like that's where I think this kind of engagement um, will be much greater. Thank <laughs> you.